Muy buenos días, tengan todos los presentes el día de hoy. Vamos a celebrar la audiencia número 4 en el 191 periodo ordinario de sesiones. El título de la audiencia es Impacto de la Ley de Delitos Cibernéticos en la Libertad de Expresión, Religión y Conciencia. Doy una cordial bienvenida a la sociedad civil, también a la ilustre representación del Estado. Y también quisiera presentar quienes me acompañan en la mesa, la comisionada Gloria de Mes, la comisionada Andrea Pochac, nuestra secretaria ejecutiva de la comisión, Tania Renau, el relator especial de libertad de expresión, Pedro Vaca Villarreal. Antes de iniciar la audiencia, quisiera recordar que la CIDH celebra 65 años de trabajo comprometido con la defensa y la promoción de los derechos humanos gracias al interés y pacto común de los estados y las sociedades de dar vida a la Convención Americana y a la Carta Democrática. Desde 1959, cientos de personas profesionales han pasado por esta institución y miles de personas, colectivos y pueblos han acudido a la comisión solicitando su protección, justicia y reparación. Celebramos 65 años de historia con más de 100 visitas sin loco con sus correspondientes informes, más mil medidas cautelares otorgadas, más de 750 informes de fondo, 220 soluciones amistosas y 377 casos enviados a la Corte. Todo ello con las víctimas como el eje central de nuestro trabajo y nuestra prioridad. Para asegurarnos que esta audiencia sea inclusiva, solicitamos a todas las personas participantes que inicien sus presentaciones indicando su nombre, su cargo y la organización o institución a la que representan. Posteriormente, cada vez que tomen la palabra, agradecemos que vuelvan a decir su nombre al inicio, de tal manera que las personas con discapacidad visual puedan identificar quién hace uso de la palabra. Del mismo modo, recordamos que estas audiencias disponen de subtítulos en Zoom. Cada persona puede activarlos directamente desde sus equipos y elegir el tamaño de visualización. También están disponibles para las personas que nos siguen a través de nuestros canales de la CIDH. La distribución del tiempo eh, será otorgando inicialmente a la sociedad civil un lapso de 20 minutos para su intervención, posteriormente al Estado por 20 minutos. La Comisión Interamericana tendrá luego 15 minutos para hacer preguntas o algún comentario. Devolveremos la palabra para que puedan responder a la sociedad civil por 12 minutos y comentarios al Estado por 12 minutos. Por último, la Comisión tendrá 8 minutos para hacer el cierre de esta audiencia. Así que, sin más, una cordial bienvenida y daríamos inicio a la audiencia dándole la palabra a la sociedad civil por 20 minutos. Distinguished Commissioners, uh, Government Representatives and Guests, I'm Julio Paul from ADF International. We have been invited to discuss the implications of the Cybercrime Bill for the International Human Rights Obligations described by Barbados on the matter of freedom of expression. The bill has already been approved by the House of Assembly and is pending in the Senate. We're concerned that parts of the bill represent nothing short of blatant government censorship. While the Barbados government should protect its citizens from real digital threats concerning cybersecurity, obscene content, and violence, it should not be leveraging these legitimate issues to restrict free speech to spare people from annoyance online. Parts of Article 19 and 20 of the Cybercrime Bill violate the basic human right to freedom of speech enshrined in international law and the Constitution of Barbados. To these articles, I will limit my presentation. Article 19 states that malicious communications uh, are those in which a person intentionally uses a computer system to disseminate any image or words not caring whether they are true or false and causes or is likely to cause or subject a person to ridicule, contempt, or embarrassment that uh, is uh, 
person should be uh, liable of $70,000 of an, as a fine and imprisonment up to 70 years. Article 20 of cyberbullying uh, says that a person who intentionally uses a computer system to publish, broadcast, or transmit data that is offensive for the purposes of causing annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, embarrassment, insult, injury, humiliation, intimidation, hatred, anxiety, or causes substantial emotional distress to that person is guilty of an offense and is liable in summary conviction to a fine of $70,000 or imprisonment for a term of up to seven years. The vague language used in sections of Articles 19 and 20 criminalize online expressions that otherwise constitute lawful speech under international law. It is against freedom of expression protections to punish expressions in person or online that can be offensive or that can cause annoyance, inconvenience, danger, embarrassment, insult, injury, humiliation, intimidation, hatred, anxiety, or substantial emotional distress. Likewise, it is utterly disproportionate to criminalize online, online expressions just because they could cause or subject a person to ridicule, contempt, or embarrassment. Article 13 of the American Convention protects freedom of expression and provides the condition under which the states can limit those expressions, those, those rights. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has said that freedom of expression has an individual and social dimension and that it is a cornerstone of every existence for a democratic society. The court explains that every expression should be allowed, including those that could shock, concern, or offend the state or any sector of the population. The court and, the, and this commission have made it clear in many cases that the right of freedom of expression includes sharing ideas or information that might offend certain people or cert specific individuals. Similar protections are granted in Article 19 of the International Covenant of Civil, Civil and Political Rights. The Human Rights Committee has said that the scope of paragraph, sec, paragraph 2 embraces even expressions that may be regarded as, as deeply offensive. In 2019, David Kay, former U.S. Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, said that restrictions on expression must be exceptional, subject to narrow conditions, and strict oversight. He, said, he continues, the terms ridicule and justification are extremely broad and are generally precluded from restriction under international human rights law, which protects the rights to offend and mock. Both the American Convention and the ICCPR provide conditions under which the state can restrict expressions, and the first of these conditions is legality. Any restrictions needs to be expressly established in law. The Inter-American Court has, says, has said, that any limitation must be previously, expressly, specifically, precisely, and clearly established in the law. It must be formulated with sufficient precision to enable persons to regulate their conduct, to be able to foresee to a degree that is reasonable in any circumstance the consequences which a given action may entail. The Rapporteur of Freedom of Expressions has said, vague, ambiguous, broad, or open norms by their mere existence discourage the emission of information and opinions for the fear of sanctions. The state must specify the conducts that may be subject to subsequent liability to avoid affecting the free expression of disagreements and protests about the actions of the authorities. This condition must be stricter when criminal sanctions are established, as the principle of strict legality must be complied with. We should remember this is a criminal law that imposed a seven-year penalty at least and $70,000 in fine for somebody that expresses uh, any, any expression that with these broad and vague terms. According to the Inter-American Court, the definition of a crime must be formulated in a manner that's prior, explicit, precise, and exhaustive, because criminal law is the most restrictive and severe means of establishing responsibility for unlawful conduct. These strict and unequivocal, unequivocal terms should be the ones used to define criminal behavior, as in this case it should be and it is not. This involves a clear definition, says the court, of the incriminatory behavior setting its elements. In a case uh, so resolved by the court, Yuson Ramirez versus Venezuela, the court stated, uh, quote, the court observes that the criminal codification of Article 505 of, of the Organic Code of Military Justice does not establish the elements that may offend, slander, or disparage. Namely, continue the quote, this article responds to a description that is vague and ambiguous and that it does not specify clearly the typical form for a criminal behavior which could lead to broad interpretations allowing the determined, determined behaviors to be penalized incorrectly by using criminal codification. This opens the possibility for abuse of discretion by the authority, particularly undesirable when criminal liabilities of individuals should be established and penalized. Quote, Moreover, the inter-American system has said that vague and ambiguous laws with the rap by the rapporteur 
has said, can particularly impact the growing universe of individuals whose inclusion in the public debate is one of the principal advantages offered by the internet as a space for global communications. So legal restrictions must be precise, public, and transparent. The vague language is manifest in sections 19 and 20 of the bill, which criminalize expressions that cause annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, embarrassment, insult, injury, humiliation, intimidation, hatred, anxiety. These are broad, undetermined, and undefined terms. They are nothing more than subjective feelings, making it impossible for, to create a standard of proof. Finally, any law that seeks to criminalize online content that is subjectively deemed annoying, embarrassing, or anxiety-inducing is absurd in a free society. Core to the free interchange of ideas is the ability to voice views in the digital marketplace that may offend. The sweeping criminalization of online expression will engender large-scale human rights violations in Barbados. Subjecting someone to egregious penalties, fines, and jail time up to seven or 10 years, and tens of thousands of dollars for expressing their views online is inexcusable, even if these expressions may offend. And these expressions are protected by international human rights law. My name is Donald Leacock, and I will speak on the bill's impact on social media influencers in Barbados. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Many thanks for the opportunity to address this body on an issue of profound concern for all citizens across the Organization of American States who value freedom and democracy. We believe that freedom of expression is a fundamental human right that is at the core of a healthy and vibrant society. Yet, this freedom of expression is blatantly being stripped from us in this draconian cybercrime bill that the government of Barbados is forcing onto the citizens. This is evidenced by the fact that Section 20 of the bill seeks to criminalize internet use that is considered to have caused anxiety or emotional distress, with potential fines of up to 50,000 US dollars, prison terms of up to 10 years, or both. Should our citizens be thrown in jail for a decade simply for posting something online that pol political elites can claim makes them anxious or emotionally distressed? The Attorney General has already declared to the public that the results of today's hearing are non-binding, showcasing how little this government care about democratic dialogue, the OAS itself, the people of Barbados, and more with enforcing their unjust laws. I'm a social media influencer in Barbados. My content receives millions of views each year. My content spans comedy, education, philanthropic initiatives, and social change-oriented posts across all platforms. I use these platforms not only to entertain and connect with my community, but also to educate and highlight issues I believe these needs change. This bill, however, threatens to criminalize that. The law's deliberately vague language leaves it open to interpretation and therefore abuse. If a viewer claims that my content caused them anxiety, as many of my posts about inflation or economic uncertainty do, I could face up to 10 years in jail, a $50,000 US fine, and costly legal battles. The government aimed to intimidate us into forced silence, knowing full well no one can afford these severe fines or spend a decade away from loved ones merely for expressing themselves online. Objections to this bill are evident and widespread. This bill has been met with constant active protests throughout the nation. Cyber experts worldwide have rejected the merits of this bill, and most importantly, the people of Barbados have vehemently disapproved of this bill. And this is why we the people must continue in our civil resistance and ensure that our voices can never be silenced. We ask you today to stand with the principles of justice. We ask you to stand with the people of Barbados. We ask you to stand with the mission of the Organization of American States. We ask you to help us safeguard these last few remnants of freedom of expression in Barbados and to remind this government that true democracy across the Organization of American States can only thrive when freedom of expression is upheld everywhere. Good morning, I'm Shekwani Hunt. Today I speak on behalf of activists and broadcasters. Can I say that? Will I lose my government contract or job if I write that? If I lend my voice to this commission, will I be victimized when I get back to Barbados? Welcome to Barbados where we're chilling. Can you feel it? The chilling effect that occurs when I hesitate to exercise my legitimate right of freedom of expression for the fear of negative repercussions. How is the chilling effect achieved in this very sunny paradise of an island? 
Beneath our diverse cultural landscape, below the preview of tourists, the government cats a culture is steadily expanding. I submit to you that this government's dangerous cancel culture is the underlying cold front that causes the chill. There is a cause of trouble a government worker participated in a protest march against the perceived government corruption, who is now victimized daily and no longer in line for promotion. And it's this troubling climate that we hear the thundering interest of the cybercrime bill, specifically sections 19 and 20. While this bill could protect our children from online predators and the Barbadian population from online crimes, it also brings a cold front of chilling effect on the broadcasters, activists like myself and the Orvish Barbadian. A woman's ability to organize online and call for change, being seen through movements like Me Too, which I saw Barbadian women use the internet and social media to speak out against sexual harassment, abuse, the call out for predators and to push um, semantic change. Today, I ask the Commission to consider how this type of activism will be negatively impacted by the proposed cybercrime bill, especially sections 19 to 20. I speak on behalf of myself and the other Barbadian women and young girls in my line of work and ask you to examine this bill and determine whether or not Barbados should adopt criminal charges to broadcast open-ended concepts such as alleged anxiety, humiliation, intimidation, emotional distress, which can be easily abused used against us for the interests of women, particularly in high patriarchal societies where women like me attempt to challenge the status quo. So I am carrying out my job. If I cause anxiety, humility, or great emotional distress, I could actually go to jail for 10 years or face a fine of $100,000. So that will, what would that do for female activists and broadcasters? Should I resort to the familiar place of silence to be seen and not heard? Welcome to Barbados, where the chilling awaits the fate of the cybercrime bill. I'm Reverend Dr. Ferdinand Nichols, and I'm here to express the deep concerns for myself and my multi-faith colleagues in Barbados regarding the content of the cybercrime bill 2024. My colleagues and I believe this will pose significant challenges to freedom of expression and religious liberty, especially for Christian ministers. This cybercrime bill introduces vague terms in section 19 and 20, including humiliation, intimidation, anxiety, and substantial distress and threatens the long tradition of the multi-faith community of freely sharing their faith, Muslims, Hindus, Rastafarians, and others alike. Christian themes such as the consequences of unrepentant sin or the concept of an eternal punishment in hell, among others, preach with the intent to bring in change for the better in someone's life. Some listeners after hearing a sermon may claim in their opinion that they experience substantial emotional distress or anxiety and may take that preacher to court. If the court upholds that complaint, the preacher may face a fine of $100,000 and or 10 years in prison. This could jeopardize the freedom of preachers to share their faith in places of worship or public spaces or through the media. The bill's provision on emotional distress could impose caution and even self-censorship on preachers who may avoid discussing certain documents and certain doctrines which are central to the gospel out of fear of lawsuits. The Rastafari community who believe in the empowerment of the Afrocentric culture emphasize that the distortions of the Bible oppress Africans, and some may now find that someone who finds that reference emotionally distressing or intimidating can now take legal action against them, claiming offense, intimidation, or emotional distress. The American Convention on Human Rights in Article 12 clearly affirms that everyone has the right to freedom of conscience and of religion and to profess or disseminate one religion or beliefs either individually or together with others in public and in private. Article 13 states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought and expression, either orally in writing, in print, in the form of art, or through any other medium of one's choice. While legal accountability might be imposed to protect others' rights or national interests, freedom of thought of expression should remain free from prior censorship and the right of expression may not be restricted by indirect methods or means, such as the abuse of government or private controls over newsprint, radio broadcasts, frequencies, or equipment used in the dissemination of information or by any other means tending to impede the communication and circulation of ideas and opinions. Given the aforementioned facts, the cybercrime bill should address clear, objectively identifiable behaviors, such as hate speech, threats against life, defamation, and extortion. 
These actions are clear cut and can be measured with specific criteria. Thank you. Members of this session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, buenos dias. I am Timo Howard and a spoken word artist. Sections 19, subsection 3, and section 20, subsection 1 of this bill stand as an unnecessary and harmful barrier to the freedom that we artists need for creative social discourse. The goal of a safe digital space is not exclusive to the artistic range and way of freedom of expression and conscience, as these are vital components of a democratic society. In fact, it needs that range. Historically, creative work has been used to boldly challenge the status quo, break taboos, and promote societal development. From George Lamming to George Orwell, the United Artists Against Apartheid to Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson, Dave Chappelle to Andrew Scholes, from the White Rose anti-fascist graffiti to women defining women in contemporary art of the Middle East and beyond. Maya Angelou, Langston News, me, and maybe you. Range of artistic expression is vital. And we will explore how section 20, subsection one of this cybercrime bill, if passed as is, hinders it. Consider this example. I'm going to compare America and Barbados. We use two distinctly different forms of government, but this is a rough comparison for a frame. As there are 50 states, there are 30 constituencies. As there are governors, there are sitting MPs, members of parliament, who represent those constituencies. In one constituency in Barbados, St. Lucie, we have over a decade, for over a decade, experience notably subpar water quality. It is poor. Can you believe that the representative of this constituency said that it is irresponsible for the persons in this constituency to not pay for this water which is brown and sometimes smells and ruins their white clothes, among other things, and causes other challenges and problems? He had the insensitivity and lack of situational awareness to say this. He should irresponsibly lose his constituency seat. Commission, would you believe that if he claims he felt my expression was offensive and intended to produce anxiety or humiliate him, he can file a criminal charge against me and I could be ordered to pay a fine of up to 50,000 United States dollars and serve up to 10 years in jail simply for sharing my honest opinion on what this MP said, which was aired on national radio. At age 20, my bank account isn't built to bear the fine of 50,000 US dollars. And in terms of the 10 years, one could say that time is on my side, but that hardly means it should be stripped from me so callously and casually. Add to that the stigma of conviction and it seems like a dark road ahead for me. We artists need the facility to express our perspectives freely without that penalty. Even when our work confronts uncomfortable truths or highlights issues that may be found distressing, as the saying goes, art imitates life, life imitates art. And I can tell you, Neither life nor art are always perfectly pleasant. Commission, I say again, this bill stands as a barrier to the freedom that we artists need to address social issues openly. And as we can see, it can leave charged young artists broke and broken. So I ask you, in this special 191st session, on behalf of Barbadian artists, please strongly and exhaustively encourage the Barbadian government to collaborate with the artistic community in instilling safeguards to prevent genuine harm without impeding these necessary creative liberties found in a thriving democratic society and without quite probably disadvantaging our youth who represent the future of our culture and our country. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Y pasamos ahora al Estado la palabra por 20 minutos. Buen dia, bon dia, bonjour, good day. Thank you, Commission. My name is Robert Volterra. I am external legal counsel to the government of Barbados in this procedure. And Madam President, members of the Commission, I have the honor to present Barbados's observations to you today. 
The Commission informed Barbados that the scope of this hearing is defined by its designated title. And that title is, quote, Impact of the Cybercrime Bill on Freedom of Expression, Religion and Conscience in Barbados, end quote. Thus, Barbados's observations today address that impact in the context of the inter-American system. Since 2021, the government of Barbados has engaged in an ongoing and transparent conversation about cybercrime and the cybercrime bill. This conversation has included civil society, as well as domestic and international experts. Barbados welcomes and embraces the decision of the Commission to join this ongoing conversation. The complainants who asked the Commission to hold this hearing did so via a written document called The Request. The request sets out the claimant's views on the cybercrime bill. But the, the request adds nothing new to the ongoing conversation. The claimants have merely repeated to the Commission the same views that they or like-minded people have already made during the ongoing conversation in Barbados. And of course, they're perfectly entitled to, but it's nothing new. This is not the start of a conversation and nothing new has been brought forward. The complainants or like-minded people obviously already felt safe to say these same things during the conversation in Barbados. And this shows us two things. First, that the conversation in Barbados, amongst and within and with civil society and the government, has been robust, transparent, free and accessible. Second, that this conversation has been taking place in a safe space, that is to say Barbados. Otherwise, they wouldn't have felt safe to say exactly the same things. Barbados is well known to be a safe space for civil society conversations. The complainants have not denied the fact that they had multiple opportunities to share their views, these exact same views, and they did share their views with the government before this hearing. Barbados society has always valued and prioritized the transparent and comprehensive social and political dialogue that takes place in the country. Barbadians are proud to have one of the longest continuously functioning parliaments in the world. Their legislature was established in 1639, making it the second oldest in the Americas. In a few years, Barbadians will celebrate their parliament's 400th anniversary. The reforms to Barbados's cybercrime legislative framework have been designed to respond to the seriously harmful, dehumanizing, and destabilizing effects of cybercrime in Barbados and on Barbadians. Increasingly and on a daily basis, Barbadians are being targeted by such cybercrimes as child pornography, terrorism-related offenses, cyberbullying, malicious communications, money laundering, consumer fraud, bank fraud, financial crimes, financial theft and identity theft, to name just a few. Such crimes are serious and their consequences can be devastating. They can cause life-threatening physical harm, severe mental health issues, immeasurable economic hardship, and debilitating reputational damage. They significantly harm individuals, organizations, businesses, and government in Barbados. The Barbados Commissioner of Police has reported that cybercrime in Barbados has become, quote, mammoth, close quote. He warned that it is far-reaching in Barbados society, and he warned that it knows no boundaries. Online hate crimes have become a particular concern for Barbadians. This includes malicious communications and cyberbullying. 
Social media and other online platforms have enabled such crimes to spread their poison insidiously throughout this small island state. The effects of such cybercrimes can be extremely harmful and they are of grave concern to Barbadians and Barbadian civil society. Victim, victims of online hate crimes frequently experience severe mental health issues. These in turn often cause serious physical harm and even suicide. And the members of the commission and everybody in this room read about these every day. We know these things to be true. Children and teens in Barbados are especially vulnerable to these cyber crimes. The Council of Europe reports that in many countries, more than 50% of children and teens, and sometimes as high as 80% of them, experience online hate crimes targeting themselves through social media. Cybercrime and its awful consequences are of great concern to Barbadians. The government listened to those concerns. It then des designed the cybercrime bill to protect Barbadians from the harmful effects of these criminal activities. The existing Barbados law against cybercrime is the Computer Misuse Act. It is outdated and it is recognized to be insufficient to combat modern cybercrime. And it is no longer compatible with international standards. In 2021, the Council of Europe approached the government of Barbados with an offer to share its experience and expertise in fighting cybercrime. It offered to help the government modernize Barbados's cybercrime legislation in two ways. First, to combat the dehumanizing, harmful, and destabilizing consequences of cybercrime effectively, and second, to develop a legislative framework consistent with international standards and best practices. At the same time, the government solicited the views of Barbadians. Whilst they were being trained by the Council of Europe, government officials also met with Barbadian cybercrime experts and those who would be responsible for enforcing the new draft legislation. <coughs> the government also ensured a healthy and robust conversation amongst and with civil society about cybercrime, including specifically about the cybercrime bill. The claimants the Commission will undoubtedly have noticed, do not allege that they have been denied opportunities to make their views known to the government. And the complainants have expressed, as I said in this hearing, no new views to you, which they or like-minded people have not already made publicly to the government during the ongoing transparent conversation in Barbados. This confirms that even before this hearing, the Barbados Civil Society conversation has been robust, transparent, free, accessible, and taking place in a safe space. The government introduced the Cybercrime Bill to Parliament in 2023. A first reading of the bill took place that same year. The bill was discussed during a parliamentary session in January 2024, and a second reading of the bill took place in February 2024. Each of those parliamentary sessions, like all parliamentary sessions in Barbados, was transparently live streamed on the Barbados Parliament YouTube channel. Copies of the cybercrime bill were also made available to the public at the same time. Following continued public interest. Once Barbados's constitutional legislative process moved the bill to the Senate, the Senate decided proactively of its own initiative to continue the conversation with civil society about the bill. It therefore established a joint select committee to organize a series of engagements with civil uh, engagements with civil society. In doing so, 
Parliament was motivated to facilitate even greater participation in the conversation that was ongoing from civil society within the safe space of Barbados's constitutionally protected, human rights observant democratic processes. This phase of the conversation had both written and verbal components. The government actively encouraged all members of civil society, including by advertisements, to send written observations on the bill to the Joint Select Committee. From a population of 282,000 people, the committee received 48 written submissions from civil society. Civil society groups and individuals were then provided yet further opportunities to make submissions. This time, they were verbal, live, and in person before the committee, and members of civil society took up that opportunity over a series of months. As I have noted before, the fact that the complainants or like-minded people actively participated in all phases of these public consultations and shared the same views there as they have with you here confirms that Barbados is a safe space for vibrant civil society discourse and that it has taken place in relation to the cybercrime bill. Once enacted, Barbados's cybercrime legislative framework will be fully consistent with international standards. These include the human rights standards of the inter-American system. It will also be fully compatible with the Budapest Convention, and it will conform to the draft UN Convention Against Cybercrime. The Cybercrime Bill includes a number of provisions that are not included in the Budapest Convention, nor in the draft UN Convention. These provisions include sanctions for online hate crimes. But of course, this does not make the bill incompatible with the international standards set out in those treaties. Not at all. The list of cybercrime offenses in the Budapest Convention and the draft UN Convention are not intended to be exhaustive, and they are not in fact exhaustive. And the Council of Europe itself recognizes that the Budapest Convention does not cover all aspects of cybercrime. Indeed, the Council of Europe encourages states to adopt, adopt additional legislative protections that are consistent with other policy objectives. And this is what Barbados has done. In addition to being compliant with international standards, the cybercrime bill is also consistent with domestic law best practice around the world, including in the Americas. Many of the views expressed in the complainant's request relate to the criminalization of online hate crimes, and you heard about it today and namely malicious communications and cyberbullying in sections 19 and 20 of the Cybercrime Bill. The criminalization of online hate crimes is fully consistent with the domestic law best practice in the Americas and around the world. Examples of this can be found in the relevant laws of a wide variety of states across the world, including, for example, Antigua and Barbuda, Austria, Belize, Brazil, the British Virgin Islands, the People's Republic of China, the Dominican Republic, France, Guyana, Ireland, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Singapore, Slovakia, and the United Kingdom. And these are just examples. Moreover, the language used in Barbados' cybercrime bill to criminalize online hate crimes replicates relevant language used in many domestic legal systems. The penalties for online hate crimes are also consistent with the penalties found in comparable international best practice domestic legislation, including in the Americas. The cybercrime bill importantly for our hearing today, is fully compatible with the rights to freedom of thought and expression and freedom of conscience and religion as protected under the American Convention on Human Rights. The right to freedom of conscience and religion 
and the right to freedom of thought and expression are protected under Articles 12 and 13 of the American Convention. These rights, however, as the Commission knows, are not absolute. In the text of those articles, the Convention expressly anticipates limitations on these rights. In fact, as the Commission knows, the Convention identifies as being legitimate limitations that are created to protect, and I'm quoting just from the text of the Convention, rights of others, reputations of others, national security, public order, public health, morals. The Cybercrime P Bill protects precisely such societal imperatives, and you heard this morning the complainant's reference to the fact that the Cybercrime Bill does, and they recognize it, does protect things like the rights and reputations of others. Of course, such limitations must be, first, prescribed by law, second, necessary, third, proportionate, and the cybercrime bill meets each of those requirements under law. The cybercrime bill is prescribed by law, having been created in Barbados's constitutional rule of law and human rights respecting democratic procedures. It has not been enacted yet, but it's still in those procedures. And also, for having been subject to extensive public consultations and civil society dialogue. Any limitations on the freedoms identified that are contained in the cybercrime bill are necessary, and the Commission can reassure itself about this by reference to the global consensus on combating cybercrime evidenced in the Budapest Convention and the draft UN Convention. Any limitations on those freedoms in the cybercrime bill are also proportionate. This is shown by reference to the draft legislation, uh, draft, draft legislation's conformity with international domestic law best practice. And finally, the provisions of the cybercrime bill are necessary. They are required to protect Barbados and Barbadians from the devastating harm to their economic, social, mental, and physical well-being that is caused by cybercrime. In this respect, again, the bill is consistent with the global consensus about fighting cybercrime. The government of Barbados has made great efforts to ensure that its cybercrime legislation strikes an appropriate balance between, on the one hand, the right to freedom of thought and expression, and the right to freedom of conscience and religion, as well as other human rights and domestic constitutional protections, and on the other hand, the urgent imperative protect to protect Barbados and Barbadians from the pervasive, destabilizing, and dehumanizing harmful effects of cybercrime. Civil society in Barbados has had multiple and fulsome opportunities to participate in the safe, open, and transparent conversation about this. The cybercrime bill is still in the legislative drafting process. There may be further minor adjustments made by Parliament before it is enacted into law, but already it has achieved the objective of balancing competing rights and imperative protections for Barbadian society and for Barbadian people. The fact that the complainants do not agree with the balance struck in the bill has been publicly known long before this hearing, and that's a testament to the open and free social and political dialogue that takes place in Barbados. But it is noticeable that, uh, notable that the complainants failed to inform the Commission about the various government-organized consultations and conversations, and you should think about that. They didn't tell you about those things. But the complainants or like-minded people have had multiple opportunities already to share their views with the government. Barbados welcomes the Commission's interest in joining the ongoing conversation about the cybercrime bill. Barbados thanks the Commission for this opportunity to share its observations. Gracias, obrigado, merci, thank you. This ends Barbados's submissions. Muy bien, muchas gracias también al Estado. Vamos a pasar ahora a un momento donde la Comisión podrá hacer algunas preguntas o comentarios. Así que trasladaré inicialmente la 
palabra a la relatora país, la comisionada Gloria Jiménez. Thank you very much, Chair. And good morning. Is it still morning? Yeah. Good morning to all present, delegation of um, the state of Barbados, and also the delegation of civil society. Thank you for the presentations uh, given. As I've listened to presentations from both civil society and the state, I thought it would be good to go back to almost a month ago when I visited uh, Barbados as a country rapporteur and had the opportunity to notice, to record the commitment of the state with respect to the promotion and protection of human rights, especially in the context of the mandate of the Inter-American Commission. But also, I noticed and recorded the active interest of social society, of civil society, with respect to the promotion and protection of human rights and the work of the commission. This is not the first hearing, but it's the first hearing in a long time. I think 20 years have passed. So having this hearing at the heels of a technical cooperation visit and having noticed and heard the many initiatives from the state with respect to human rights. And on the other hand, the interest of civil society with respect to initiatives concerning challenges in human rights. I think it's important that this hearing has brought out the impact as um, articulated and illustrated by the civil society, different um, fractions within civil society, faith-based women, artists, and then on the other hand, the initiatives from the state. And listening to what has been presented, I think very important it is that on the one hand, civil society actors had the opportunity to voice, to give voice to their issues. And on the other hand, I heard the state said, within the national domain, the domestic domain, we have granted them the same opportunity and we heard the same thing. And I think that is very important. The question is, are we hearing and are we listening? And what are we doing with what we have heard? So in that regard, and going back to my um, mission last month, I think my question is to both the state and civil society, how can the commission play a role in what we have heard today? How can the commission play a role in bringing together the voices that we heard, heard today, the request for certain elements within the bill to be considered? How can the commission play a role? Our mandate 
and the mechanisms to facilitate that mandate. Incorporate technical cooperation. They include capacity building. They include mechanisms to create, enforce, strengthen dialogue and action. So my question is to both the state and civil society, how can we play a role in respect to this particular bill? Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, comisionada. Doy la palabra a la comisionada Andrea Pocha. Muchas gracias. Sorry, I will talk in Spanish. Eh, muchas gracias a, a la sociedad civil y, a, y al ilustre estado de, de Barbados por esta audiencia. Es una audiencia que demostró un diálogo productivo, un diálogo racional, con, con un espíritu de, de respeto mutuo. Las audiencias de la Comisión Interamericana tienen el objetivo de facilitar el diálogo, de visibilizar situaciones que a lo mejor se dan en el país, que tienen diálogo en el país, pero que es preciso visibilizarlas más. Y también tienen el objetivo de contribuir desde la Comisión Interamericana a, a impulsar, eh, a fortalecer políticas públicas en materia de derechos humanos. Así que celebro esta audiencia sobre un tema específico de, vinculado con la libertad de expresión en, en Barbados. Eh, quiero quiero re, eh, resaltar también, reconocer la, la alta delegación del Estado y también la diversa y, y muy interesante delegación de, de la sociedad civil. Hay una coincidencia, ambas partes coinciden en que es eh, legítimo legislar sobre eh, cibercrimen. Ambas partes reconocen que hay un fin legítimo en la legislación que se propone. La, la libertad de expresión, por supuesto, eh, no es un derecho absoluto e incluye, eh, permite limitaciones, restricciones, eh, y entonces puede ser una, una legislación que tiene un fin legítimo. Pero como el sistema interamericano nos enseña hace muchos años, esas restricciones pueden tener un fin legítimo, pero pueden no ser raz eh, razonables, pueden no ser proporcionales. Y eso es lo que estamos discutiendo en relación con estos dos artículos, estas dos secciones del proyecto de ley. La libertad de expresión, lo sabemos, eh, sobre todo cuando se trata de asuntos de interés público, puede ser eh, incómoda. Las expresiones artísticas pueden ser muy incómodas, muy provocativas, pero el derecho está para proteger eh, justamente ese tipo de discursos, discursos críticos a la gestión pública, discursos provocativos eh, sobre la sociedad. Bienvenido entonces los discursos provocativos. Eh, el Estado nos informa que, que hubo un debate parlamentario muy robusto, no lo vemos eso en muchos países. El Estado también nos informa que hubo un espacio para escuchar críticas, para escuchar aportes, donde la sociedad civil participó, donde se escucharon a expertos, tampoco es algo que solemos ver en muchos países. El Estado nos informa que el diálogo con la sociedad civil es un diálogo que aún está abierto y que es un diálogo seguro y transparente. Eh, y que el proyecto de ley no está terminado, el, el, el proceso parlamentario todavía no ha concluido. Entonces me sumo a las palabras de la comisionada de MIS y, en, y entonces pregunto, ¿cómo podemos hacer desde la sociedad civil, desde la Comisión Interamericana con... Eh, sobre todo los aportes de la Relatoría Especial de la Libertad de Expresión, que tiene 20 años de experiencia en este tema, ¿cómo podemos hacer desde la Comisión Interamericana para contribuir en evitar estos riesgos específicos que la sociedad civil está marcando? Para que la crítica pública no sea criminalizada, para que las expresiones artísticas no sean perseguidas, 
en fin, para que se persiga el crimen, eh, eh, el crimen cibernético, para que se persiga la, la pornografía infantil, para que se persiga el acoso, eh, el acoso cibernético, para que se persiga la estafa y, y el robo de datos, por supuesto, pero sin criminalizar y perseguir la crítica pública, las expresiones artísticas, el debate abierto en una sociedad civil. Entonces, nuevamente ofrecer desde eh, la comisión y en particular eh, la, el aporte que puede hacer la Relatoría de Libertad de Expresión para evitar estos riesgos específicos que se están señalando. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Le voy a dar la palabra al relator especial de Libertad de Expresión. Muchas gracias, eh, comisionado, y agradeciendo también la, la participación tanto de la sociedad civil como del Estado. Eh, yo quisiera relevar que en el año 2022 la Relatoría Especial, en su informe anual que hace uno que cubre todos los estados de los cuales hacemos seguimiento, ya advertía sobre este proyecto de ley y ciertamente el hecho de que se haya registrado entonces y hasta el momento, digamos, no, no ha tenido una, una aprobación plena, eh, da cuenta de, un, de una participación, da cuenta también de desacuerdos, que, que es algo que también quisiéramos dejar reflejado. Y el hecho de que este antecedente ex, exista también implica que vamos a seguir haciendo monitoreo y balance de la situación y por lo tanto, tanto esta audiencia como la información que se quiera seguir aportando va a ser de gran utilidad para el monitoreo de, de, de la Relatoría Especial. Lo segundo, una pregunta dirigida al Estado, mencionaban que además de este diálogo abierto en un espacio seguro, transparente, que frente a eso no tenemos, digamos, ningún, ningún, ningún reparo, eh, se, se tienen pendientes unas fases en, la, en sede parlamentaria para la finalización de este proyecto de ley. Eh, ¿Cuáles serían y más o menos en qué tiempo se estiman ustedes que esto se puede sortear? Y si esta audiencia le resuena lo suficiente como para que en esos ajustes pudieran considerarse algunas de, de estas preocupaciones. Cierro con, con, con dos ideas. La primera... El humor y el arte que fueron mencionados en esta audiencia suelen ser de esas fronteras absolutamente valiosas y difíciles de encuadrar en contextos legales. Eh, y frente a ellos eh, pues existe una protección interamericana frente al hecho de que puedan ser chocantes, irritantes, incómodos, incluso en contra de visiones contravioritarias y todo proyecto de ley que eh, pueda, digamos, tocar estos, estos, estos linderos, estas fronteras, eh, es bueno que haya conversación al respecto, ¿no? eh, y es bueno que las autoridades tomen en consideración el sistema interamericano. Eh, mencionaban desde la representación del Estado que hay eh, una conversación abierta a nivel global también en Naciones Unidas, y quisiera resaltar dos discusiones que no están saldadas, y, a la misma, y al mismo tiempo preguntar al Estado si estas discusiones ya las sortearon en el diálogo. Número uno, duplicidad de delitos. Es decir, hay delitos que ya existen en los códigos penales que en algunas conversaciones de eh, cibercrimen empiezan a, du a duplicarse. ¿no? Y entonces ahí está la pregunta de si lo que deben ocurrir son agravantes o condiciones especiales cuando pasa en la tecnología o si se trata de un delito autónomo. Me parece que esta es una conversación que también retoma lo, lo, lo global que me gustaría preguntar al Estado si lo ha tenido en cuenta. Y la segunda es una conversación clásica de libertad de expresión, es la vaguedad o las alegaciones sobre vaguedad y ambigüedad, ¿sí? siendo esto algo que pues, levanta muchas preguntas sobre los márgenes de libertad de expresión. Yo me sumo también a lo que han dicho eh, quienes me han antecedido en la palabra, creo que hay un campo de eh, articulación eh, simbiótica y colaborativa entre el sistema interamericano y esta conversación. Muchas gracias, comisionado. Muchas gracias, relator. Le doy la palabra a la secretaria ejecutiva. Gracias, eh, comisionado Ralón, y muy buenos días. I will speak in en in, in Spanish. Um, primero, como ya lo ha mencionado la comisionada de MIS, esta es la primera audiencia en 20 años y yo quiero comentar que las audiencias no tienen por objetivo decir que un Estado es responsable, culpable o inocente o que la sociedad civil es responsable o inocente. Es un diálogo interamericano. Y el diálogo interamericano que nosotras facilitamos cada periodo de sesiones muchas veces tiene que tener el objetivo de que de aquí salgamos con horizontes, por ejemplo, de cooperación técnica, de conversaciones pendientes, de conversaciones que aún están inacabadas. Entonces, a mí me gustaría preguntarle al Estado en estas conversaciones inacabadas, tras esos diálogos que se han hecho eh, 
en, en el país donde la sociedad civil ha participado, ¿qué se hace con esas observaciones de la sociedad civil? ¿Qué se, cómo, ¿Cómo las observaciones y las preocupaciones de la sociedad civil están o no reflejadas en esa iniciativa legislativa? Y si aún es tiempo de seguir conversando y de reflejar las preocupaciones. Creo que es objeto de preocupación utilizar el derecho penal para limitar la libertad de expresión. Es la última ratio del Estado, es el, el elemento más punitivo. Pero a mí me gustaría preguntarles a las personas solicitantes de esta audiencia, ¿ustedes cómo conciben los límites al derecho a la libertad de expresión? En el entendido que como todos los otros derechos, no es un derecho absoluto. Porque me puede eh, hacer ruido el uso del derecho penal, pero también interpela proteger a las personas que se sienten acosadas, que se sienten, eh, y no me refiero solamente a los funcionarios públicos, me puedo referir, por ejemplo, a las mujeres con el ciberdelito de las distintas formas de violencia de género que puede ocurrir. ¿Cómo están concibiendo ustedes los límites de la libertad de expresión en el proceso, eh, considerando la cultura, considerando las instituciones y la institucionalidad, considerando la práctica, dónde estaría ese límite de un derecho que no es absoluto. Y preguntarle al Estado cómo se ha incorporado la perspectiva de género en una iniciativa que también debería de proteger a las mujeres de forma diferenciada. Hemos hablado aquí, usted, el abogado, se ha referido a ciberdelitos como la pornografía infantil, como el, la ciberseguridad financiera y efectivamente el Estado tiene el deber de proteger a las personas. Y en ese deber de proteger, ¿dónde está el deber de proteger a las mujeres cuando son víctimas de delitos y de ciberataques que están relacionados con la violencia de género? Gracias, comisionado. Muchas gracias. Y... Estamos tomando como comisión unos minutos de la parte final de la audiencia. Yo quisiera hacer rápidamente dos preguntas. La misma pregunta, tan, las preguntas son tanto para la, la sociedad civil como para el Estado. Y dado el título de esta audiencia, pregunto a sociedad civil si existe riesgo a la libertad de religión y de conciencia. Si pudieran profundizar qué riesgos ven ustedes a la libertad de religión y de conciencia. Y esa pregunta al Estado en su proyecto de ley, si considera que la libertad de religión y de conciencia tiene algún riesgo o no, según el proyecto de ley. Y la segunda pregunta, eh, también para ambos, es si existe alguna fase de revisión o de reforma, según el procedimiento que existe en Barbados, donde se pudiesen todavía hacer ajustes a este proyecto de ley, ¿existe la posibilidad legal de que algún concepto pueda ser acotado o ya va muy avanzado el proceso y no existe esta posibilidad de revisión o de reforma? Y por último mencionar que en este marco del diálogo interamericano, en distintos momentos la comisión ha brindado cuando se le es requerido asistencia técnica y muchas veces la asistencia técnica es para poder revisar algunos conceptos, algunos temas muy específicos y puntuales y la comisión siempre está abierta a, a escuchar cualquier solicitud en la cual pueda colaborar con la experiencia que tiene de temas similares que ha abordado en la región. Entonces quería dejarlo también mencionado. Siendo así, eh, en este momento continuamos con la agenda. Cada una de las partes, tanto... Sociedad Civil como Estado tendrán 12 minutos. Iniciamos con la Sociedad Civil por 12 minutos. Barbados and George today afirm uh, that they will lose if Articles 19 and 20 of the bill pass as they have been proposed. That's the first thing. The second thing, uh, the government argues that there has been a dialogue, but this dialogue is not real when 29 seats of parliament are occupied by the government, the, the government party, 29 out of 30 seats. So the opposition has just one seat in parliament. So any negotiation and dialogue at a political level in parliament is really not effective at this level. It also was said that there were, there were many uh, uh, 
people or uh, um, submissions presented. And that might be true. It is also true that many were disallowed. And it is also true, and this is the most important part, that the only end or the only conclusion of those submissions was to increase the penalties from seven years to 10 years in jail and from 70,000 Barbadian dollars to 100,000 Barbadian dollars. So if this is called listening to the people of Barbados, I don't know what is called ignoring them because these submissions were intended to present arguments. It is also said that these arguments are not new and are well known to the government. It might be that true, but they are new to the, to the commission. And this, this is why we have this time with you to present these arguments to you. Uh, it is also one, answering the questions of uh, um, Commissioner Demise. What do we want? We want the commission to remind the government of Barbados of its duty to protect human rights. We want the, we want the commission to, remain the, to remind the government of Barbados its duty to protect freedom of expression as enshrined in the American Convention on Human Rights. We want the commission to make sure that the government of Barbados knows that restrictions on speech cannot be based on overly vague, broad, indeterminate terms and concepts, and that criminal penalties, as was said by Secretary Tania Renaum, are the ultima ratio and need to be clear and determinate. You cannot have restrictions as the one imposed in Articles 19 and 20, according to the American Convention of Human Rights, according to the Inter-American Courts and this commission's uh, jurisprudence and case law. He was asked also, how do we understand the limits of freedom of expression? We understand them as the same way that the American Convention posits them in the document. And, and again, criminal, uh, crim criminalization or criminal liability for expression is another form of censorship that should not be used unless express and clear laws that detail exactly what is the uh, expressions that are being punished. You cannot have a law that says that not even the words that you say are, are bad, but the consequence or the effect of those words are, are wrong. That is utterly uh, uh, outrageous because it's subjective. Uh, and finally, I just want to remind again that we are here also in favor of the protections in, of people that need to be protected, minors, as in the bill, what was called child pornography, cyber, cyber crime, uh, all these protections that are necessary. And we are all in for that because we know that that's a duty of the state, duty of the government. What we don't want and what we don't like and what we think it's against the convention are Articles 19 and 20. All other protections that are said by the government are just and fair. We don't disagree with that. And that's not the topic of the conversation. Ultimately, it is, you know, in our point of view, the Budapest Convention is not the, it should not be the governing document of this law in the sense of what we're talking in this, in this table, in this session. What we are here today is to compare the law as the bill, as it is written, to the American Convention on Human Rights and its protection of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and, and, the, and the rights enshrined in the convention. And those rights are not protected, are not protect, will not be protected if Articles 19 and 20 pass as they are. And just to remind the commission of what's the process, how's the process going, the bill was passed by parliament. Again, parliament has 29 of its 30 seats uh, are belong to one single party, which is the government's party. So parliament passed the bill, then the bill is pending in the Senate. Modifications can be made to the bill under ordinary legislative process. They should not be unless they go again to the, to the discussion in the lower house. Nonetheless, the Joint Select Committee made some modifications in the text that if those modifications are approved by the Senate, then the Senate should pass them again to the house to, to reverse the process and the house to approve. But the problem is that those modifications made by the Joint, Joint Select Committee do not reflect the, the protections of the American Convention. As I said before, the only real modifications of the, of the proposed, of, proposal of the Joint Select Committee was to increase the penalties from seven years in jail to 10 years in jail, from $70,000 to $100,000. 
But the fact of the matter is that vague and broad terms as anxiety, humiliation, uh, still subsist in the law. Uh, it, I have here Article 20 of the this Joint Select Committee proposal says, a person who intentionally uses a computer system for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, embarrassment, insult, injury, humiliation, intimidation, hatred, anxiety, or causes substantial emotional distress is guilty of an offense and liable of uh, $70,000 and, and seven years of imprisonment or both. Uh, so this is this is what it is. It is. Uh, I don't think the dialogue that has been mentioned is uh, effective and honest. I'm trying to add, if I can, please, um, the fact that after the recommendations of several persons from the civil society, and incidentally, there was, as far as I recollect, one hearing for civil society. I am not aware of an ongoing dialogue with the Barbadian public on this bill. And as a result of that, as a matter of fact, the bill was passed in Parliament, went to Senate. It was pulled back from Senate as a result of the objections of the Civil Society of Barbados. And then it went to Joint Select Committee. In that Joint Select Committee, I was one of the uh, uh, persons uh, presenting in that Joint Select Committee, along with several others, including one of the legal experts, one of the cybercrime experts on the planet, who strongly recommended to the government to pull back on this bill. As a matter, as, as a result of that, the Joint Select Committee removed the term embarrassment from Section 19 and 20, Criminal defamation still remains, even though we have a defamation law in Barbados that will uh, attribute a $2,700 fine or something in that matter, in that area, to a person for defamation, but does not criminalize the individual. Rather than addressing the concerns about excessive fines, the committee increased the fines from 70000 to 100000 and the prison term from 7 to 10 years. And while terms like annoyance, inconvenience, obstruction, embarrassment, and insult were removed, citizens may still face severe penalties for causing humiliation, intimidation, anxiety, or substantial distress online. Our uh, take on the matter is that these areas are far too vague and not specific enough to be uh, risking an individual criminalization. We are talking here about a citizen of Barbados going to jail for 10 years for this matter. Commission, I will be brief. Firstly, um, similar to Dr. Ferdinand, I am not aware of the exhaustive dialogue from 2021. I would be appreciative if some references of those dialogues in 2021 and 2022 could be provided. That would be fantastic. Additionally, um, Mr. Voltaren, you spoke of the fact that the ideas we're presenting here are not novel, but I will go to somewhat of a riddle, somewhat of a uh, phrase, puzzle. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Yeah? If it is that, as, and it is, as Julio would have said, that the, the level of opposition to the sitting government is not productive enough or not strong enough to actually offer any sort of resistance to what's being pushed in parliament, then it is very easy for you to say, well, we've had the discussion, we've had dialogue, and we've talked about it, and you've expressed your beliefs already, and we're here now just wasting time. While you can easily have not really, as I dare say you haven't, taken really into consideration the concerns of the Barbadian people. You mentioned our legislation history as well. Um, the majority of those 400 years you are speaking to actually were in the context of colonial oppression as well. So that isn't really something to boast about per se either. As one of the commissioners would have said, no one here is denying the necessity of safeguarding our digital environment. But I would say when that the guardrails become cages, it becomes dangerous. 
going back to you, Mr. Voltara, because you spoke for the 20 minutes. I would ask you what image, what use is the image of a safe space where citizens' cries fall on deaf ears? And I would give you these two situations, which is better? A baby in a burning building cries and a fireman hears and saves them. Or a newborn baby that's crying and undergoing complications and the nurses and guardians in the hospital walk around happily speaking of the peaceful environment in which they're in as though that child is not suffering. I would compare our current situation to the latter of those two. Additionally, the logic in your, your argument is not really intellectually honest, I would say, because as much as you say we are saying the same things, as much as you say that what you are saying, what you have proposed in the bill does not bring any excessive restriction on freedom of expression and freedom of conscience. We have given examples of how it does. You have not given a reasoning, a process by which you have decided that it does, by which you have came to the understanding that the limitations you have set are actually in keeping with not just the US human rights um, agreement, but also our constitution in Barbados. Thank you very much. Barbados is grateful for the questions and observations from the Commission. I forgot to say I'm Robert Volterra, if, if, for, for those who, who uh, need to, to know that. Given the importance of this issue and the uh, profundity of the observations and questions from the Commission, which Barbados welcomes and embraces, Barbados intends to take the opportunity offered previously by the Commission to respond more fully in writing subsequently. Um, and some of the questions and some of the dialogue you've heard today uh, emphasize why responses in writing will be required because there's some precision that's needed. I'll, I'll get to it, but um, but uh, my friends uh, on the other uh, table made a number of embarrassing factual errors that, that we will need to clarify, and, and I'm sure they'll be embarrassed once they realize, for example, unfortunately, Don, Don Julio was talking about an old version of the draft, not the latest, as he was quoting. Um, so so that, that's the sort of thing to clear up more precisely in, in writing. Um, in the meantime, Barbados has a number of immediate responses, and I'll, I'll go through those. Um, as, uh, as everyone seems to recognize, Barbados, independent Barbados, has a long and uninterrupted history of, of democracy, constitutionality, rule of law, law, and respect for human rights, and Barbados is grateful for the Commission's recognition of that. Barbados has a well-deserved reputation around the world as a safe place, a safe space, as some people say, for the free exchange of ideas, and transparent dialogue amongst civil society and between civil society and its government. Barbados was honored just a few weeks ago with a visit to which uh, Commissioner uh, Denise uh, mentioned, was delighted to have that site visit, and was glad that uh, through her, the commission was able to see for itself that Barbados is a small island state with a small close-knit society that its politicians are not located in faraway citadels high in a mountain or somehow isolated from civil society. Barbadian politicians conduct their work in a parliament building that is located at most one, two hours away by bus from the furthest part of the, the island. Barbadian politicians and civil society interact personally on a daily basis. They meet shopping, dining out, on excursions to one of the country's beautiful beaches, at religious sporting and and social ga gatherings up and down the island. In the years since its independence and even before, Barbadian politicians have invited and celebrated dialogue, transparent discourse with, with the public. And given the physical reality of Barbados as a small island state, its politicians would have no way to avoid regular conversations with civil societies, even if they wanted to. There is a constant, synergetic, intimate, and meaningful conversation between Barbadians and their elected representatives. Throughout their history since independence, and even before, Barbadians have been actively encouraged by their governments to voice their opinions, formally and informally. Criticisms are not encouraged, and they're certainly not punished. 
and they are welcomed and diligently considered. And I'll get to that. The Cybercrime Legislative Project has been no different. An extensive conversation has taken place about the Cybercrime Bill with domestic and international experts, with stakeholders, and with civil society. And as Commissioner Denise noted, this is quite unusual and special, and Barbadians are very proud of that. And this is but um, one of the many examples of meaningful conversations down the years between successive governments and Barbados civil society. In their request, and indeed today, the complainants have failed to identify a single example from Barbados's history when its government used legislation, regulation, or its authority to stifle dissent, to, to silence civil society, to suppress criticism of governments or politicians. Barbados society has worked to ensure that it's a safe space for the free exchange of ideas in an environment where democracy, the rule of law, and human rights flourish. Amongst the fundamental rights and freedoms but bar that Barbados actively safeguards are the rights to freedom of thought and expression and freedom of conscience and religion. Barbadians are free to articulate their opinions and ideas without fear of retaliation, censorship, or legal sanction. The examples, the so-called examples given in the request by the complainants refer to other countries in other parts of the world with dramatic, dramatically different histories of governance and 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 uh, civil discourse or lack of civil, civil discourse that has nothing to do with Barbados. The observations submitted by the complainants reflect only one voice in the Barbados conversation. It's an unhappy voice. They're unhappy with the balance that's been struck through the results of the conversations that have been going on, but they represent only one narrative. And indeed, they represent a narrow perspective of Barbados society and of Barbados society's view about cybercrime and the cybercrime bill. For example, a few days ago, one of Barbados' most popular political and social commentary social media sites reposted an article about this hearing and about the complainant's re uh, request um, uh, for the hearing and about the complainant's views on the cybercrime bill. And as of this morning, some 90%, 90% of the comments posted there were negative about the complainants, about their critical views on the cybercrime bill, and about their request for this hearing. Now, all that is is just like what you've heard today, some people expressing a view. That's what it is. But it shows that the views being expressed today are representative only of the people making those views known. And of course, the government of Barbados must weigh and balance all of civil society's views as it identifies and pursues the best interests of the country. And with regret, um, I have to say, I'm sure unintentionally Dr. Julio misled you and was corrected thankfully by Reverend Ferdinand. In fact, after the public consultations written and oral, and after the criticisms and comments were made from civil society, the Joint Select Committee did adopt some of the suggestions. The draft bill as it is now is not, with all respect, what Dr. Julio read out to you. You can see it online, it's there, you can check it for yourself. I'm sure your, your secretariat will do so, and I'm sure Dr. Julio will be a bit embarrassed when he realizes he was using a months old version when he talked to you. But there are a number of material things changed. And to his credit, Reverend Ferdinand mentioned some of those. For example, the removal of the word embarrassing and so on. That came as a result of direct representations from civil society. So when the commission asked what there was arising out of these conversations, there, 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 there was acceptance of different points of view and different um, ideas and criticisms being presented. It was uh, not just a, an empty exercise, a tree falling in the forest. Of course, obviously the complainants are unhappy, otherwise they wouldn't have requested the hearing and they wouldn't be here. But just because they're unhappy about the outcome of this democratic constitutional 
process because they're unhappy about what things were and were not uh, adopted from the ideas they put forward as compared to other members of civil society and so on. That is not a reason to say that there is anything wrong with the cybercrime bill or that the balance decided upon by the government is inappropriate and certainly not that it violates the inter-American system or any international laws or obligations including articles 12 and 13 of the American Convention. The terrible consequences of cybercrime harms a great many Barbadians, and it seems that everybody on this room accepts that, which is healthy. It's good. We, we all read every day the terrible things that can happen. And someone, a representative of a society, has to decide where to draw the line, where to have the balance. And in Barbados, that is the government. Currently, the, the government is composed of members of a party that, that are all the same party, but that's because the people of Barbados voted in free elections and decided that a couple of times. Doesn't mean it's not democratic. And other people can speak better than me, but different voices are brought into the appointed Senate to deal with those um, unifocuses. The fact that any portion of civil society is unhappy with a particular outcome doesn't mean that civil society has not been heard and that there haven't been um, incorporations of ideas and amendments of thoughts. They clearly have in this instance, and we'll happily set these out in, in greater detail. But it's the government of Barbados's job to protect Barbados society and to protect Barbadians, whilst ensuring an appropriate balance of other rights and freedoms, including domestic constitutional safeguards. As we noted, and as the Commission noted, international human rights standards around the world, including the um, American Convention, recognize there are limitations on the right to freedom of thought and expression and so on. There, there are limits. They're not absolute rights, and there's a, a, a judging factor going on. Those limitations are necessary to protect other fundamental rights and freedoms and legitimate interests of society. And governments around the world, including the government of Barbados, have the obligation to balance those different rights and competing freedoms and interests when it comes to cybercrime. And it's the sort of balancing that is precisely envisaged in the American Convention. And that's what the government of Barbados has done throughout the legislative process. There's a global consensus in relation to cybercrime across a broad range of states. You can see it in the Budapest Convention. You can see it in the cybercrime, uh, the UN Convention. And the cybercrime bill conforms to that consensus. And that includes protecting rights and freedoms contained in the American Convention. The Barbados government has spent more than three years transparency consulting international domestic experts, the Council of Europe, Barbados Civil Society, amongst others, and it's done so to design a, a legislative framework for Barbados to protect Barbadians. The outcomes of these is the cybercrime bill. It will provide Barbados and Barbadians with a projective legislative framework that is fully compatible with Articles 12 and 13 of the American Convention. Le voy a Barbados thanks to the Committee for this further opportunity to share its observations. And this ends Barbados' submissions. Quisiera, quisiera pedir un derecho de réplica, ya que él me mencionó que yo dije algo falso. Yo leí el artículo 7, el artículo de la ley, del, del proyecto de ley, como ha sido pasado por el Parlamento en la Casa de Representantes, en la Cámara Baja, a, a, a efecto de que el Senado lo apruebe. Eso es ahora mismo lo que tiene más peso de ley. Efectivamente, okay, el Joint a, Select Committee hizo unas favor, modificaciones, pido, pero mientras no se apruebe, favor, que... no puede decirse que se, se me está acusando de decir algo falso, que no lo hice. Yo leí el artículo que fue aprobado por la Casa Baja a efecto de que el Senado lo apruebe. Si sí es cierto que el Joint Select Committee emitió unas recomendaciones, que las recomendaciones que se hicieron no afectan absolutamente en nada todo lo que yo dije. 
porque son términos siempre vagos y siempre indeterminados. Gracias. Ok, les pido por favor que respetemos la agenda que había indicado. Ambas partes han podido externar sus puntos de vista y han agotado su tiempo. Tanto han agotado su tiempo de, de intervención como de respuestas. Eh, el objetivo, como se indicó de la audiencia, no es una audiencia confrontacional, no es una audiencia de deliberación de un caso, es una audiencia de diálogo, así que les pediría por favor que ya no hagan uso de la palabra porque nos corresponde hacer el cierre por parte de la comisión por razones de tiempo. Voy a, tenemos alrededor de tres o cuatro minutos porque ya habíamos utilizado nosotros un momento eh, anteriormente, Así que le voy a dar la palabra a la relatora de país si quiere hacer algún comentario final. Adelante, por favor, comisionada de más. Thank you very much, and I thank once again all present delegations of state as well as um, of civil society. I think this hearing is of very important hearing. It speaks to a bill, cybercrime bill, that now has cybercrime bill on freedom of expression, religion, and conscience. It has the attention of the whole of the Barbadian society. As I would say, I've heard today, not only as you expressed your concerns, facts, but also as you expressed what it has generated in terms of dialogue um, within the Barbadian society. So I do think that this hearing is a very important hearing because it stresses the need for dialogue, the need for dialogue within um, national jurisdictions. It expresses the need of one, voices that express concern, but also the consensus that there is with respect to protections that the bill provide. What I hear from this session is that the dialogue may be perceived by some has come to a close. But I fairly, I clearly hear as well that there is a lot of room for more dialogue to specify language that is vague, maybe ambiguous, to make it very clear what is the purpose, <coughs> the scope, the room, maybe, but also the limitations of this bill. And as I said, and my colleagues did um, in the earlier intervention by the commission, the commission is ready to assist you in this dialogue. Thank you very much. Chair, I yield the floor to you. Muy bien, por razones de tiempo, vamos a llegar al final de esta audiencia, quizá solo destacando dos ideas eh, finales, una de ellas es la disponibilidad de la cooperación técnica de la comisión, estamos abiertos a, solic a solicitud del estado, lo hemos hecho en otras temáticas, en otro, con otros estados, si hay alguna posibilidad de apoyar, de revisar algún texto, es algo que la comisión interamericana ha hecho en el pasado. Y la Relatoría de Libertad de Expresión, que ha venido monitoreando este tema, lo continuará haciendo. Es uno de los aspectos que 
a lo interno de la comisión ha manifestado la relatoría que estará dándole un seguimiento muy cercano en el monitoreo. Así que sin más, yo quisiera agradecerles, agradecerle a los peticionarios, al Estado por esta audiencia y damos por finalizada la misma. Muchas gracias.